Good evening. My name is Michelle Francel, and as a member of the advisory committee of the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College, a regional center for exploring science and spirituality, I would like to welcome you to the Sugarloaf campus of Chestnut Hill College and to this evening's lecture. As many of you know, the Institute seeks to promote the constructive engagement of science and spirituality with science and technology, fostering a conversation that is interfaith, multi-science, and above all, civil. We sponsor lectures, a reading circle, and our original resource for speakers. You can find a growing number of our videos of past lectures, along with a list of relevant books housed in the Logue Library and our blog at the website, irands.org, or follow us on Twitter at Institute for RS. And if you'd like to be on our mailing list, be sure to sign in at the desk in the back. Our theme this year is human flourishing. And some of our upcoming programs include Mark Wallace from Swarthmore, who in February will be looking at the spiritual need to engage the environmental problem at deep levels. An afternoon in March, thinking about civil dialogue with Janice Mock, the former executive director of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, who will share something of the process that the LCWR officials used in their conflict with the Vatican. And in April, a reflection from Jesuit Tom Rees on Pope Francis's encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si. Please join us for any of these events and bring a friend or two along. But this evening, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Schultz, Chair of the Psychology Department and the Rachel C. Hale Chair in the Sciences and Mathematics at Bryn Mawr College. Professor Schultz studies emotion and stress processes and the effect of relationships on mental and physical well-being, exploring basic questions about the dynamics of emotion processes and the ways in which they affect and are affected by relationships such as marriage. Dr. Schultz has a particular interest in understanding how we regulate emotions and what the effect of these regulatory efforts might be on our health. He has consulted internationally on adult development, most recently in Chile, and is leading a study for the National Institute on Aging around socio-emotional processes and health. His work on mindfulness has led to the creation of a set of integrated courses at Bryn Mawr on mindfulness and contemplative practice. And full disclosure, I've taught one of those courses. Uh, Mark is a long time and good colleague. And he'll talk to us tonight about the psychology of mindfulness, what we know and don't know. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Mark Schultz. Thank you all. Thank you, Michelle, for that nice introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I was delighted to be asked to be part of this interesting series on flourishing. And um, appropriate, I didn't know exactly what the venue would look like, but it's appropriate that you're seated at tables. Because I hope to offer you what I think will be a buffet of research <laughs> on mindfulness, so that you'll have something to talk about. Yeah. I also want to note that um, I have a particular connection to Chestnut Hill that I need to note or else I'll be in big trouble. My stepmom is a 50-year uh, graduate. She just celebrated her 50th year in a reunion. Um, I think they call them golden gals here. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. Um, so maybe this room reflects this idea that mindfulness is hot. It's a uh, topic of great interest. Uh, it's certainly in the media. How do we know it's hot? Because Oprah says it's hot. Yeah. <laughs> and a number of other people there. I was pretty pleased I could identify most of those people, but most of them are celebrities. Um, it's also a very hot topic in psychology and in particular areas of science that have to do with neuroscience. And I hope to share some of the excitement that's going on and some of the questions that are uh, being addressed in those fields. So my plan is uh, to start with an attempt to define what mindfulness is. Um, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that first. And then I'm going to go through a series of studies that give you a picture of how mindfulness has uh, been studied. Um, at the beginning, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an important influence, which has been Eastern contemplative practices. Um, not that those are the only influences, but they've had a particular meaning. And you'll see uh, that as I describe this history. 
Um, and I'm going to try and give you a picture of mindfulness practice and research and contextualize it by giving you a little bit of the history of where this research came from. I'm going to be selective in what I highlight, but I think I will give you a fairly representative picture of what uh, is going on in research in psychology on mindfulness. So let's start by um, talking together about what mindfulness is. And I'll start with always a great person to quote. <laughs> So Yogi just passed away, sadly, a few months ago. Um, and this is not a bad definition. Um, he said you can observe a lot just by watching. And, and at its core, this is really what mindfulness is about. It's paying attention, watching, observing. I'm going to get a little more sophisticated. This is John Kabat-Zinn. Um, and John Kabat-Zinn, I'm going to say a lot more about as a key figure in mindfulness research. Um, he's an early Western mindfulness researcher, really a key figure in translating some of these Eastern ideas um, in a way that was accessible for Western audiences. Um, this book, Full Catastrophe Living, has been a best-selling book, um, very popular, and it outlines his strategy for teaching people mindfulness. Again, I'll come back and say a little bit more about this. But he defines mindfulness as paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. And I will come back to these ideas, but each of those clauses are important there, separated by those commas. Um, one thing I want to note about his perspective is that mindfulness in this way is a state or a way of mind, and there are a number of other ways to talk about mindfulness. And one way is to think about mindfulness as a practice, perhaps what many of you came to learn about, um, things like meditation. <laughs> so meditation is one form. I love this picture. Um, it seems obscene, but it's not. <laughs> um, mindfulness is something that people can do. Uh, meditation is one example of a mindfulness practice, but I'm going to elaborate on other examples. Um, and I want to start by going back to Yogi's definition. Yogi has other meaning in this context. It's great. Um, and mindfulness practice is about paying attention, as the Yogi Berra definition suggested, and the Kabat-Zinn idea. So one very popular activity in mindfulness classes, some of you may have had some exposure to this, is eating a raisin. Um, it's a kind of mindful eating. Um, and it's quite interesting. The idea is to eat a raisin and to view a raisin as if you have never seen a raisin before. So the exercise starts by having you taking a look at a raisin and noticing textures in that raisin, noticing colors in that raisin, holding it up to the light, noticing the way a raisin might reflect light, the degree to which it's translucent or not. Then you can go to smelling, so you want to engage all of your senses in this observation of a raisin. You can go to smelling. Raisins actually make noise if you hold them near your ear. You should do this if you haven't. It's kind of cool. Um, you then begin the part that we all do, but we don't do very slowly. You can put it on your lips and your tongue and note what it feels like to taste a raisin and what's going on in your mouth. So the idea is to very slowly observe things that typically we're fairly mindless about when we eat. And this is an early and good example of mindfulness practice in many mindfulness interventions. Um, focusing on your breath is another common uh, exercise. And breath is handy for a whole bunch of reasons. One is we carry it around with us, hopefully. Um, and it's rhythmic so that it's easy to pay attention to. It repeats and cycles. So observing your breath is a pretty fundamental part of mindfulness exercises across many traditions, including the modern Western versions. Um, and the idea in mindfulness is not to change your breath, not necessarily to slow your breath down, but just to notice it and the noises that you make when you breathe. And for many people, just focusing on your breath is really hard to do. They tend to get distracted. They tend to think about things that they've been trying hard not to think about. So for many people, this burden of distraction and getting filled with the stuff of our life, what did I not do, what do I need to do later, not being in the moment is the challenge of focusing on your breath and also focusing on a raise. So I also want to make clear that the goal of mindfulness isn't really, at least at the start, relaxation, like many people think. There are relaxation exercises that can be used as part of mindfulness training. 
But the goal of mindfulness is really to help people learn to attend, uh, to observe and attend to experiences. So I think it's probably hard to see all the way in the back, so I'm going to read this cartoon. This is a beginning meditator. I realize I've only been at it for five minutes, but meditation isn't bringing me the peace of mind I was promised. And in the circle is fret, worry, future, past, right? Anything but present experience is the idea. Very common for people who start mindfulness. I want to note, um, again, to provide some context, some of the uh, important pioneers in mindfulness research. And at the same time, I'm going to be highlighting some of the connections between these researchers and Eastern um, contemplative practices. I'm going to start by talking about Herb Benson. Um, many of you are familiar with Herb Benson and some of his work. Um, he's a cardiologist that's uh, been at Harvard Med School for quite a long time. And he did some pioneering work in the 70s that still is influential in terms of the nature of the work and the kinds of questions that he asked. Um, one of the things that he was interested in is um, a group of monks in Tibet that um, had incredible control over things that Western scientists were surprised people had control over. So things like peripheral skin temperature was a focus of interest. Um, so these monks, which practice a particular kind of yoga called Tumo Yoga, um, are able to raise their peripheral skin temperature by something like 17 degrees, which is pretty extraordinary. And these are monks, you may have seen pictures of them that tend to hang out in the snow in the Himalayas, and as part of their training, they'll often go out with wet clothing or wet sheets on their back, and they're able to raise their skin temperature to such degrees that the, the sheets steam dry in that snowy climate. So quite dramatic practice, and he was interested in how people could do this. So he began to study commonalities among different practices, yoga, um, other practices like meditation, even looking at more Western things like hypnosis, which also can be used to calm and relax people. The relaxation response was published in 1975. When I teach about this to my students, I say your parents probably have it somewhere on your shelves. Uh, this was a very popular book for quite a long time. Some people have it on their shelves still. Yeah. Um, and what he found is that there's some common attributes among these different mindfulness practices, some of them, again, directed at relaxation. Um, and those common elements have to do with things like a quiet environment, some sort of repetition. Sometimes it's repetition of a phrase. Sometimes it's repetition related to things like the breath. Um, and some exercise that focuses the mind's attention in a particular way. Um, he also talked about a comfortable position, um, but I think that's tricky because we all know that some yoga practices, for example, aren't always comfortable. Um, what he found is that a bunch of these different techniques, the shared commonalities resulted in a short-term response that was common across all of them, and they had to do with calming the body in a particular way. So the short-term changes included a reduction in heart rate, blood pressure, muscle tension, and an increase in peripheral skin temperature, which is what happens when our body relaxes. So very important, sets a foundation for later research. John Kabat-Zinn, who I alluded to, who actually has a Philadelphia area connection. He went to Haverford College as an undergraduate. Um, another important early pioneer, um, as I suggested, very influenced by Eastern traditions, particularly Buddhism. Um, and an interesting figure, and this will be a theme that you'll hear me repeat, um, he's trained as a molecular biologist, has a PhD in molecular biology, had an interesting career as a researcher, but got interested in helping folks that weren't being helped by traditional Western approaches to medicine. So he was interested in people that had conditions like chronic pain, uh, chronic illnesses that were um, being helped to the extent that people weren't dying from them, but there were lots of challenges of daily living. Um, other kinds of illnesses that we think often have an element that uh, is reactive to stress, so things like eczema or gastrointestinal problems, these were the kinds of patients that he was interested in helping. Um, he also worked with folks that had very serious conditions that um, created coping challenges of their own, so folks that are suffering from uh, cardiac problems or cancer. And he opened up at UMass Worcester um, the uh, stress reduction clinic, he did this in the late 70s, and he developed an eight-week mindfulness class. Um, I put class in quotations here because it's important. He thinks about this as educational. Uh, I will sometimes refer to this as psychotherapy, um, but John Kabat-Zinn framed this as an educational skill training class that was uh, open to folks that may uh, have a need to reduce their stress or deal with their stress. 
Um, it's eight weeks. Uh, I'm going to describe uh, in just a second, but I want to note that MBSR as a model has become very popular. It's offered in many countries around the world. On their website now, they list uh, over 200 centers around the world that have affiliated in some way with the MBSR program. Um, a few things I want to say about MBSR. Um, one is that it's a pretty neat translation of Buddhist ideas and practice, but you wouldn't necessarily know that from taking the class. There's no reference to Buddhist spirituality or to the story of the Buddha. It's really designed to um, get around the cynicism that Western doctors were likely to have, particularly in the late 70s in medical settings, and Western patients were likely to have about this being kind of weird and different. Um, so it doesn't have the trappings of spirituality or Buddhism in it directly, um, but I would say it's a fairly good translation of lots of um, basic Buddhist practices that have been around for a long time. Um, two to three weeks, two to three hours per week for eight weeks, the course runs. It includes a day-long retreat. Um, it includes a number of practices um, that all, in some ways, focus on observing things, especially focused on observing your body in some way. So the kind of breathing exercise we talked about, a body scan is another important part of it where you literally can lay down or you can sit and you scan your entire body. A good body scan can take 50 minutes or an hour. Uh, so it's very hard to maintain that attention. You go through different parts of your body and again, singular focus on the present experience. Um, there's some, what they call mindful yoga, which is a nice way of saying uh, yoga for people that aren't so good at yoga. Um, it's not very hard physically and it emphasizes sort of mindfulness and awareness in those experiences. Another important part, which I think is often overlooked is its emphasis on everyday mindfulness. So Kabat-Zinn and others have this idea that it's not just when you practice in particular ways, like focus on your breathing, but it's when you're driving or paying attention to your partners or to your kids, that that kind of focused awareness and presence is something that the program is trying to foster. And perhaps we can come back to this, perhaps maybe one of the most important parts of an intervention like MBSR. Um, the other thing about MBSR that's important for what I'm gonna talk about tonight is that it's eight weeks, it's highly structured, it's written out in a manual, so it's reproducible in a standardized way, which makes it a huge asset for people who want to study mindfulness practice. So it's become a very important part of modern mindfulness research. Another um, important player, and perhaps somewhat related to the goals of the Institute here, is a really interesting group called the Mind and Life Institute, um, which had its official beginnings in 1987, but had a number of informal meetings before that. And the Mind and Life Institute has featured the Dalai Lama prominently in meetings with Western scientists and Western scholars. The focus has not been exclusively on mindfulness, but the Dalai Lama has a strong interest in neuroscience and psychology, so that's often been a focus. Astronomy has been a focus as well, and general questions in religion and morality have also been a focus. Um, they have events every year, and they have multiple events. So there are events in Europe, there are events in India, there are events in the United States, sometimes involving the Dalai Lama, sometimes involving other Eastern contemplatives, but really interesting discussions that go across cultural voids and here I'm not just talking about East-West, but go from contemplatives to scientists. I've been at some of these meetings. They're, they're really quite extraordinary meetings. There's also, uh, some of these meetings have been recorded and are on the web. They're really interesting to watch. Um, there have been books also written about almost every one of their major conferences. Okay, I'm gonna to begin to get into the, the research. Uh, so for the non-scientists, now it's time to strap on those seat belts. Um, so, I'm going to talk about the Dalai Lama and a pen pal that he developed first. And this is a, a great story and led to some really interesting research. Richie Davidson is the man that's pictured here with the Dalai Lama. And Richie Davidson is a uh, very well-known, um, quite renowned neuroscientist that focuses on the neuroscience of emotions. He calls himself an affective neuroscientist. In the spring of 1992, Richie Davidson got a fax from the Dalai Lama and the Dalai Lama said, perhaps you might want to come to India in exile here um, to visit with me for some conversation. And you might even bring some of your equipment if you wanted to try it out on some of my monks. The Dalai Lama had done his homework. Richie Davidson thought about this for about one second and said, this is great. I want to go. And what he said is, 
these are the Olympic athletes, the gold medalists of meditation. What an opportunity to study. So let me say a little bit about what Richie Davidson does. One of the things he was interested in is something that he calls affective style, which is a kind of emotional set point that we all have that defines our personality. So we often describe people in terms of how emotional they are, how positive or negative they are. And he thought there was a kind of an emotional set, uh, set point that also had something to do with uh, activity in the brain. And he was interested in, in making a connection between those things. So in his work, he uses what we call an electroencephalogram or an EEG. And an EEG is basically a bunch of leads that you put on someone's head to try and figure out what the electrical activity is under the skull. So the skull turns out to be a pretty good insulator, so you need lots of leads there to get some idea of what's going on underneath the skull and the brain. So in his work, what he was really interested in, at least at this time, was the general balance between electrical activity on the left side of the brain versus the right side of the brain. He was particularly interested in this in the frontal areas, which are important for emotion and a whole bunch of other things. And what he found by studying a number of American college students and other people is that left dominant asymmetries, meaning more electric activity on the left side versus the right side, was associated with a whole bunch of good things. People who had left dominant asymmetries were happier and more even in terms of their emotional temperament. And this was a rel replicated finding, again, using largely American college students. So here's one of the um, Dalai Lama's Olympic monks. Uh, some of you may know him. His name is Matthew Ricard. And Matthew Ricard is often called the happiest man in the world for reasons that I'm about to reveal. He's also quite a jolly fellow as well. Um, interesting guy. Um, French intellectual family, has a PhD in molecular genetics. Also decided not to pursue research in molecular genetics. And he went into the Himalayas on retreat to study Buddhism with important Buddhist figures, long periods of solitary retreat. So he truly is a, an Olympic monk in terms of the hours of meditation that he's done. He's also served as the French interpreter for the Dalai Lama. So they brought Matthew Ricard into the lab and he was hooked up with these electrodes. Um, left dominant is on the, unfortunately it's on the right side. I wish I could reverse this because it's confusing, but on the right side of this figure are more left dominant um, asymmetries, and this is the sort of normal curve that Richie Davidson had got from American students. When Matthew Ricard was in his lab, this is where Matthew Ricard ended up. So I just want to give you some idea to quantify this. This is eight standard deviations from the mean of American students. So if we were talking about IQ, we'd be talking about someone with an IQ of 220 or 240. Way away from the mean here. Very unusual. So Richie Davidson said, interesting. So the question we really want to ask, what about mortals? What about non-Olympians here? Could we train people to move these asymmetries in the direction that we think is related to better emotional health? That's the question that Richie Davidson was interested in. So where do you ask this question in the United States? Well, Richie Davidson is at the University of Wisconsin, and there is a high-tech company there called Promega. I love the name. And he approached Promega, and uh, he said, if I can get John Kabat-Zinn to come in every week from Massachusetts, will you let us do some research here? And they said yes. So 48 people in the company agreed to participate. There's random assignment. Random assignment is really important. They didn't let people decide which group they were going to be in. They randomly assigned people. People had no choice. This is what scientists do. They were randomly assigned to this eight-week MBSR group or to what we call a waitlist control. So the folks in the waitlist control were told, you'll get the group, just not right away. There were pre- and post-tests given before the eight-week MBSR group and afterwards. They measured anxiety and a few other psychological phenomena. They measured brain activity using that EEG machine. And they measured immune functioning. And here it's the right time of the year. All they did was give people a flu vaccine and they looked at how they responded to the flu vaccine. So I'm gonna take you through some results. The treatment group here is in gray. I know it's hard to see, probably in the back. And the control group is in black. And I put a little arrow there in blue to give you an idea of what I want you to focus on. 
So when it comes to anxiety, reports of anxiety from before the intervention at this high-tech company to after the eight-week intervention with mindfulness is reduced. In the control group, it's roughly the same. So MBSR, we think, because they were randomly assigned to this group, had something to do with those reductions in anxiety. EEG asymmetries. Again, I want you to focus on the gray bars here. They became more left dominant, the direction that is associated with more evenness and more happiness, more positive emotions. So in eight weeks, you see the mirror images of these Olympic monks, not at the same magnitude, but you see changes in that direction that are reliably present from the eight-week MBSR class. The meditators, the folks that got the MBSR, also had a better antibody response. And forgive me, I'm gonna show you one more figure because it's really neat. So on this figure, the left dominant asymmetry is at the top, right dominant at the bottom. And on the x-axis here along the horizontal axis, this is the strength of the antibody response, the strength of your immune response to the flu vaccine. This is after the, the um, they gave the flu vaccine after the end of the MBSR group. And what you see is a linear relationship between the strength of the immune function and the degree to which those asymmetries shifted in that left direction. So more shifting, stronger immune response, suggesting that not only does it affect your brain, but it has some impact on your body as well. Okay, one study, it's a little bit old at this time, small group, it's Wisconsin, let's look at some other studies. So many scientists are interested in this idea of neuroplasticity, that the brain is plastic, can change, and it makes sense, right? It's sort of not surprising that the brain changes. We tend to think about the ways in which the brain degrades over time, but when we learn things, we have to store that somewhere. So the brain we know is plastic, but increasingly we have techniques to identify that plasticity. One of the changes that it's pretty reliable that occurs is a thinning of our cortex. The cortex is the outer layer of the brain, lots of important brain functions there. And the cortex unfortunately thins with age, which probably has something to do with the decline that all people experience normally as they grow older. Um, this is a figure that shows uh, the thickness of the cortex using MRI data, which is a, a scanning procedure at different ages, younger than 40, middle-aged, and elderly, and trust me, the brain shrinks, the cortex shrinks, it thins. So the question is, could meditation perhaps slow the thinning? And if it does, wouldn't that be a neat thing for those that meditate? So Sarah Lazar and colleagues have done a series of studies. The first big one was published in 2005. And this, again, was a scanning study, an MRI study. Um, they brought in 20 experienced meditators, long-term experience, many, many years, but variation on that experience. And they matched them up in ways that they were almost identical except for the meditation experience with a group of controlled participants. And what they found um, was that in the areas that you might expect to be different because they're engaged by meditation, so these are areas around attention, lots of areas involving sensory experience and processing of sensory uh, information, and awareness of our body, which is a central aspect of meditation. Um, meditator brains, the folks that had experience in meditation, were thicker in those cortical areas than folks that didn't meditate. And this figure here, I think it may be the last one I show, um, is also really interesting. So this is now looking only in the frontal area here, and it's looking at red are the controls, so the non-meditators, and blue are the meditators, and age is on the horizontal axis, and the thickness is on the y-axis. And what you see in the meditators is a flat line. There's no age-related decline in cortical thickness. Really interesting and exciting. Okay, small study, 20 people, not random assignment, which is really something we like, it makes it harder to make causal conclusions here, but again, suggestive of something important in terms of the long-term effects now of meditation. Another neat area. So I'm gonna talk about chromosomes and telomeres. Chromosomes are part of what dictate who we are, right? Genes and chromosomes. 
Um, and chromosomes have fenders attached to them. They have bumpers on the end. That's in red. These bumpers are called telomeres. They protect the chromosomes. When DNA is replicated, the telomeres, those bumpers shrink a little bit each time they're replicated. Replication happens all the time in our body. So with aging, those telomeres get smaller. They also get smaller for a whole bunch of reasons. They get smaller when they're stressed, pretty clear at this point. When they get too small, the cells start to malfunction. And a bunch of things happen that we think are related to the diseases of aging. So inflammation increases in the body, and it also promotes tumor growth as well, two things that aren't good as we get older. Tel telomerase is an enzyme that helps repair the shrinkage. So this is something good in the body. We want it to be active and functioning. So I'm going to tell you a little story about telomerase. This study is an intriguing one that I'm going to talk about. This is intensive meditation. So I'm not talking about the eight-week MBSR class now. I'm talking about die-hard meditation. I'm going to describe it in a minute. So this is a study by Jacobs and colleagues. 60 adults volunteered for this study, knowing potentially what they were going to be getting into. Um, again, this was a waitlist control. They were randomly assigned to one of two conditions, either a waitlist or an intensive three-month meditation retreat. So a three-month commitment to be in the study, either now or six months after the beginning of the study. How intensive? Six hours of daily meditation. Much of that in silence as well. So this is a very serious commitment for three months. And what they found in the group that was going through the intensive meditation, that their telomerase activity was significantly higher than in the retreat participants. They found a lot of other stuff too, mental health improved. But this particular finding is intriguing to people. Okay? I want to say a few things about this study because I think it has particular limitations that are important, again, suggestive of a benefit here. Um, but one question the study couldn't answer is if we all took three months out of our busy life and went somewhere nice, they went to Colorado in the mountains, might our telomerase activity increase as well? We don't know that from this study. In science, we want replication. We also want converging results. And there are other studies that hint at uh, changes in telomerase activity when people do things that are good for their well-being. So this is consistent with that, but I wouldn't say it's strong, capital S, evidence that the mindfulness was responsible for the change. Okay. Um, so those studies I described in some detail, I want to just step back for uh, just a moment and note that there are lots of studies, probably at this point thousands of studies in psychology on mindfulness. And the studies will often focus on what we call some sort of behavioral outcome, so how we respond to sadness, as an example, what we do when we're sad. And at the same time, but not always, but often at the same time, focus on a brain function or a brain area that might be related to the psychological process that they're interested in. So I'm just highlighting some of the main areas in which people have been trying to tease out these connections between mindfulness and uh, psychological phenomena and brain processes. Lots of work on attention. So mindfulness involves paying attention on purpose in the present moment. It would be logical that folks who practice or go through a mindfulness intervention might be better at paying attention. A lot of interest in this. And you can imagine the applications. So one of the... Uh, Leading researcher, researchers in this area has a large grant from the Defense Department, which is interested in having folks who are serving in our military being able to sustain attention for long periods of time. Regulating emotion is an important area, as Michelle mentioned when she introduced me, this is an area that I'm particularly interested in. Um, so oftentimes people will be given some sort of challenge uh, to reflect on a particularly sad moment. Um, sometimes psychologists do evil things like stress people out in the lab. Um, actually, the, the common stressor in the lab, it's a classic uh, paradigm, is to give a, a speech in front of people. Yeah, it's the common stressor. Um, Social behavior is an important area of focus. So one of the things that happens in MBSR towards the end, 
And this is the part that gets as close to spiritual as John Kabat-Zinn allowed in the MBSR thing, is this idea that we're connected to others. And besides being kind and non-judging to ourselves, we can also be that way to others. Very important part of many other mindfulness interventions, this aspect is called loving kindness. Uh, so it promotes compassion. And there's a lot of interest in people who have been through mindfulness training and what their social relationships are like. Are they capable of increased empathy? Are they better able at, at recognizing certain kinds of emotions? Do they have greater compassion? Um, are they nicer people in a number of different ways? Um, lots of interest in performance areas. So the military connection is partly performance stuff. Uh, but a lot of mindfulness going on in uh, athletics, uh, big area. Um, not just athletics that involves focus, but one of the challenges for athletes, tennis is a really good example of this, or golf, where you do repeated somethings and you can evaluate immediately how well you did. So if you make an error in tennis and you hit the ball out of bounds, um, that you have to go back to the next point and not dwell on it. So this is a kind of mindfulness opportunity. Lots of interest in sports coaching and performance coaching using mindfulness techniques. It's also moved into the corporate world, so performance there is also relevant as well. A very big area, and I'm happy uh, if we have time at the end to talk more about this, is looking at mental health outcomes. I'm going to give you a flavor of that. Um, John Kabat-Zinn started with an interest particularly in physical health outcomes, helping people deal with pain. So I also want to touch on that as well. Um, so in the world of mental health, um, there has been an integration of mindfulness into other arenas, not just the original eight-week MBSR class. So one of those arenas is, a, is an interesting one, and it's a very direct adaptation of MBSR. So this one is called MBCT, which is Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy. It's an uh, intervention that's been developed for folks that have depression, and its main intent is to prevent relapse from depression. So one of the challenges with depression is that people who have depressive episodes are at much greater risk for having another episode. So this is a relapse prevention technique is how it's developed, although it's also being studied for treatment of depression as well. So it's adapted from MBSR, very similar structure, eight weeks, one day long retreat. There are moments of didactic focus where the leader of the class is actually leading a discussion talking about an MBSR. It's talking about how we deal with stress. So I've been through an MBSR class. I've also been through training. And one of the frequent focuses of discussion is like uh, driving and the stress we feel while driving. In the MBCT intervention, the focus of those open discussions is on what it's like to feel depressed what happens to our thinking, especially when we're depressed. So the didactic component is trying to link thinking and depressive feelings or depressive symptoms, um, and that's how it sort of is particularly applied or adapted for folks with depression. Um, there are other therapies that are important. Oh, I wanna do mention this idea. So up on the screen, it says thoughts don't define you, thoughts are just thoughts. So one of the challenges that people with depression have is they often reify the meaning of their thoughts. So I'm a terrible person. I'm never going to get better. I do everything horribly. This is something we've known for a long time. And in MBCT, one of the critical ideas is that your thoughts are just thoughts. They come and go. Your thoughts will change. You will have other thoughts. So it reduces the power of thinking and reduces the significance that they have in people's minds. Very important part of the intervention. Um, Cognitive behavioral therapy is a very important branch of modern psychotherapy. Um, Well-proven efficacy for lots of things, especially depression and anxiety. And it's been around for a long time, and we now talk about being in the third wave of cognitive behavioral therapy. So if some of you may know a little bit about the former waves, um, cognitive behavioral therapists are interested in the distortions that people have, um, the, the ways of thinking that leads them into trouble. So if I make a mistake when I'm giving a talk, I could catastrophize about that mistake and think, oh my God, I made one mistake. People aren't going to listen to me anymore. They're going to think I'm really, you know, don't have anything worthwhile to say. So that's an example of catastrophizing, which is a common problem that people have. So early cognitive behavioral therapies were designed to change people's thinking in important ways. This third wave has a very different idea, that part of the goal of the third wave of cognitive behavioral therapy is to get people to accept their experiences. It's a kind of radical acceptance, and I'll give you some examples of it. 
So the first example is called dialectical behavior therapy. This is a treatment developed by Marsha Linehan, and she was very much in influenced by Buddhist ideas. Um, and she treats a very severe personality disorder called borderline personality disorder, in which people have um, instability characterizes many areas of their life, but a, a, a chief, a sort of core symptom is instability and emotion. Wildly fluctuating emotions, very strong emotions, and difficulty tolerating those feelings. So in dialectical behavior therapy, the dialectic here is a kind of tension between change and acceptance. Some things have to change because people are having real trouble. They tend to be folks who hurt themselves, um, engage in suicidal behaviors. But there also has to be a kind of radical acceptance that life has been hard, that that's part of the message that the therapist gives. And the other part of the acceptance message is that our emotions are not our enemy, that we need to learn how to not avoid our emotions, but to engage with them. So acceptance is also important on that dimension. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a second. ACT, or acceptance and commitment therapy, is another uh, third wave therapy uh, started by Stephen Hayes. Um, and Stephen Hayes is someone who has talked publicly about having panic disorders. He would get up to do talks. He's a professor, so it's so hard to have this problem. And he'd have panic attacks in front of classrooms and in front of uh, audiences. And he, because the technique wasn't developed yet, he got through them by asking himself this question. What's the worst thing that could happen to me when I have a panic attack? Maybe all I need to do is tolerate it to stay with it as opposed to try and avoid it. So this is what I mean by radical acceptance, and this is a technique that now has spread to lots of other disorders besides panic, a very popular approach in psychotherapy with proven efficacy as well. Okay, so I talked about the importance of replication, that as scientists we're not interested just in one finding, we're interested in trying to aggregate across many studies. And there's a technique that does this. Um, researchers will review um, past studies, and they will attempt to aggregate these studies in what's called a meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis is a fancy word for taking the findings from individual studies and figuring out a common metric so that you can aggregate them and say, overall, what do we know about the effectiveness of certain things? So in 2014, this review came out. Um, it has some controversy, which I'll just note a little bit of. Um, but this is a review of 47 studies. These are highly rigorous studies. So many studies about mindfulness-based interventions were thrown out because they weren't rigorous enough to be included. Um, they had to have random assignment. They had to have other hallmarks of rigorous studies. Um, All together, and this is the real advantage, we're not talking about 40 people. We're talking about 3,500 people in these 47 studies. This was a study that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, so very influential in medical circles, and that's the audience that they're aiming for. And the conclusions say, we have strong support for the positive benefits of mindfulness-based interventions, MBSR, ACT, other interventions that have a strong mindfulness component, for reducing anxiety, depression, pain, which was one of John Kabat-Zinn's original ideas, stress, and reports of distress, and quality of life. So people report that their quality of life has improved. There's little rigorous support, and what this means is that there's not enough studies out there that meet the standards of rigor that are critical for this review. For benefits for positive mood, people don't report necessarily feeling happier. Attentional benefits, which is interesting. Substance use, eating habits, sleep habits, or weight. So this is increasingly being used for a bunch of things. Sleep and weight are hot areas, so we will have more information soon about those particular interventions. So I want to read to you the conclusions from this study, because they're really interesting. This is what doctors are reading if they want to uh, get up on the literature. So the conclusion from this study was that clinicians should be aware that meditation programs can result in small to moderate reductions of multiple negative dimensions of psychological stress. Thus, clinicians should be prepared to talk with their patients about the role that a meditation program could have in addressing psychological stress. So this is attention primary care providers. If you have a patient that you think is stressed and may be showing any of these symptoms, meditation and mindfulness programs is an appropriate referral for you. So since 1979, when John Kabat-Zinn started his stress reduction clinic, um, 
quite a sea change, and it's partly because of all the, research, all the research that's been done over the years. The controversy in the study, I just want to note, it revolves around two things. One is um, we shouldn't be afraid of the small to moderate effects. Those are real effects, and they're substantial. Um, that's just a way of characterizing effect sizes in science, so that's terrific. Um, this article noted that we don't have a lot of comparisons of mindfulness-based interventions to active controls. So what does that mean? Is this better than other interventions to reduce depression or stress? That we don't really know. There haven't been enough studies to do that. It clearly has benefits. It's much better than a weightless control, but is it better than straight cognitive behavioral therapy for depression? That's a question that we're gonna to need to answer in coming years. Okay. I want to shift now um, and talk a little bit about a different way of thinking about mindfulness. So we've talked about mindfulness as a state. We've talked about it as a practice. I've talked a lot about mindfulness interventions and what we know about their effects on the body and the mind and the brain. Um, people are also interested in mindfulness as either a personality construct or as some people talk about it, a set of skills. That even if people haven't taken mindfulness classes, People vary on a dimension of how mindful they are, just naturally or because of the way that they were brought up. So that's the focus of this literature. It's a very large literature, so I'm just going to hit on some uh, pieces of it. Um, I do like the slide for those in the back I want to describe it. So it says mindful or mindful, two different versions of that. And in the mindful, it's full of things that you're thinking about. You really can't focus on the present versus being able to see the trees and the beautiful sun. So the way I'm going to describe this is to go over a measure that's commonly used to um, assess mindfulness as a personality trait. Uh, this is a measure by Helen Baer, um, and uh, excuse me, by Ruth Baer. And Baer and her colleagues have developed this questionnaire. Um, she talks about it as assessing mindfulness skills. It includes five components, which I'll go over in a second. It's widely used. In fact, I would say right now it's the leading measure uh, for studying uh, mindfulness as a personality construct. Um, there are some challenges that we want to think about when we talk about self-report instruments. So this is me filling in this questionnaire and saying whether these are true or characteristic of me or not. Um, people aren't always aware of themselves. There are some social desirability influences here or demand characteristics that we may want to. Mindfulness is hot, so we may want to appear mindful, even though we're not. Um, so challenges that are different than looking at um, brain processes or sort of neural connections. There also is disagreement in the field about these components, so um, I want to present them with those caveats. Um, but I think it's very helpful because it gives us a kind of rounded picture of what we may mean by mindfulness. So observing uh, is the first factor or facet, as uh, Bear talks about. So I'm going to read these out loud. I pay attention to sensations such as the wind in my hair or sun on my face. I pay attention to how my emotions affect my thoughts and behavior. So outside stimuli and internal experience. Acting with awareness. When I do things, my mind wanders off and I'm easily distracted. This is reverse scored, so people who endorse this get lower scores on this measure. It seems I am running on automatic without much awareness of what I'm doing. So if you can't remember how you got here tonight, that would be acting without awareness. Describing, this is one of the controversial ones. Um, some people think the act of describing takes us away from our experience, so some people don't like the idea that this is encoded as an attribute of mindfulness. Um, but what Bear had in mind is the idea that you could easily put beliefs, opinions, and expectations into words. I'm good at finding the words to describe my feelings. Um, you'll notice I have different colors here, and I want you to pay particular attention to the observing dimension here. Observing things outside and inside my own body. These are the fourth and fifth components. So acceptance, sometimes called non-judging. This comes directly from John Kabat-Zinn's definition. I criticize myself for having irrational or inappropriate emotions. Again, reverse scored. I tell myself I shouldn't be feeling the way I'm feeling. Again, reverse scored. So a kind of acceptance of experience as opposed to a self-criticism is what uh, is important here. And the last uh, facet, which was the one that was added uh, actually last after the measure was originally developed, also some controversy about this, um, is a non-reactivity to inner experience. So in this one, it's I perceive my feelings and emotions without having to react to them. Usually when I have distressing thoughts or images, I just notice them and let them go. 
So I'm summarizing now a huge literature, um, but people who report high scores on mindfulness report better well-being and fewer psychological symptoms. This is a well-replicated finding with thousands of individuals. So there's a negative correlation between mindfulness and psychopathology, uh, which is a common uh, focus of analysis. There's some problems with this measure and with this literature that I think are interesting, at least interesting to me, and I want to share them with you. One is this was conceived as five different facets of the same phenomena, and in psychological research, if there are five facets of the same phenomena, they should correlate with each other positively. This is true when you looked at experienced folks who have experienced meditating that the correlation among all those facets is positive and it's fairly strong. So the five facets cohere into a larger construct which we call mindfulness. But it turns out for people that don't have lots of mindfulness experience, college students, other adults that don't have lots of practice with mindfulness or yoga experience, um, these factors don't cohere as well. In fact, and this is really interesting, people who report a high tendency to observe they're aware, they watch what's going on around them, and they're monitor their own experience, sometimes report that they're less accepting. So there's sometimes a negative correlation there. And we wouldn't expect that if this was all part of a uniform or unidimensional construct there. So this is interesting. It's been a topic of lots of speculation and lots of research. The idea that in experience samples, things cohere in the right way um, raises interesting questions. But one question it raises, and it again comes back to this idea about the challenges of making good self-reports. That there's language issues here, there probably are also cultural issues. Um, so I didn't have this on the slide, but I can't resist. Um, people who binge drink a lot or come home hungover a lot are pretty observant about certain things in their body, and they turn out to report high scores on mindfulness scales. And it's not really what Ruth there had intended, not that kind of mindfulness. So this is a problem when we move out of the lab into the self-report domain, an area I do a lot of research in, but it's really challenging in lots of ways. Okay, I want to talk about one more piece of research and then I'm going to conclude and we'll open up for your questions and comments. Um, we know um, from lots of research in psychology that um, Many of us have a tendency to want to avoid negative experiences or emotions. Um, some of this is perhaps culturally determined, definitely is culturally determined, some of it is probably generationally determined. But research has suggested that avoiding negative emotions doesn't usually work. It's hard to not think about things that are bothering you. It often makes you think about them more. I can talk about why or why we think that may be later on. Um, so. The alternative is to attend to our negative experience in some ways, or to shine a light on it, is the metaphor that I want to think about. And when we shine a light on negative experience, there are varied outcomes. And here I'm being very coarse and simple, but one outcome which happens to lots of people is we start to ruminate about these things. We have trouble letting go. We think about them, and we engage in a cycle that tends to be very negative, often involves self-criticism, and it often amplifies the feelings, which is why people want to avoid them to begin with. For other people, when they focus on their negative experience, they learn things. It's good for them. So there's a lot of interest in what it is about engaging and shining light on experience that might be health producing as opposed to hurtful in some ways. So I want to talk about work that Cross and IDUC have done. This is a very recent work. It's very exciting. It's stimulated a lot of interest. So this is what we do when we have emotional challenges. So if we decide to reflect on them or focus attention, there are really two general approaches here. And they distinguish these approaches by the degree of self-immersion in the reflection. So if something bad has happened to you and you reflect on it and you immerse yourself in it as if you're re-experiencing the original event, the emotions, as if you're watching yourself there, as if you're in it. That's a kind of immersion. And the research that Cross and IDEC have done, their theory, and there is some research now that's consistent with this idea, is that that has a danger of making you feel worse when you immerse yourself in your experience. Interestingly, the alternative is a kind of self-distanced reflection, 
And this self-distance reflection, even though Cross and I don't, don't often use this language, is really what's being taught in mindfulness. So what does self-distance reflection mean? It means looking that experience but taking a step back. It reduces the heat of the experience in some way. It allows you to take literally the big picture perspective as you're pulling back and distancing yourself from it. And it probably facilitates the making of meaning, which is really important. So this is an area of very, uh, I'd say, intense research now because it's exciting to people. Um, and the trick is how we can teach people to engage in their emotions in self-distance ways that are authentic and still have these good outcomes. Okay. I want to end by just noting uh, a bunch of challenges, and um, I always hesitate to do this at the end with audiences that aren't scientists. So scientists, again, are always worried about the truth and replication, and there are lots of challenges in this kind of research. I've emphasized the challenges at the end when we talk about self-report research. But one of the big problems in the neuroscience research is the lack of same findings when we study the same phenomena. It's called replication. So I want to say for all of the research that I've talked about, here are some challenges that I think the field is facing. Um, one challenge is that we really need to figure out better ways to assess first-person experience. And here I mean those self-reports in which we get valuable information about how people think about themselves and their ability to reflect and observe in mindful ways but also to talk about other parts of their experience, including the emotions and symptoms that they may be experiencing. Another related part of this is what we call first-person accounts. So there's a very interesting area of research that brings in very experienced meditators. Matthew Ricard, the happiest person in the world, is an example of this, who are very good about replicating certain kinds of mental states because they practice this over and over and over again. They're really terrific subjects for brain studies because they reliably get to those states. And one of the areas of interest is in getting people like that to be able to report more about what the phenomenology is of that experience, what it's like to do this, and to help other folks that don't have that kind of training understand it. Um, as the JAMA report uh, suggested, um, lots of research on interventions for mindfulness. Not a lot of that research has good active controls. So we always want to compare things. When we look at medicines, we compare them to sugar pills. But you can also compare medicines to active treatments as well. So we want to compare mindfulness to other active treatments and see who wins the horse race there. Eight weeks, though, not a huge commitment, right? I want to make a little plea there for, for the value of mindfulness and the reason to do these uh, continued research trials. Um, replication, 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 I've talked about a lot, but it's really the hallmark of science. Um, psychology has a problem with replication. Uh, particularly, there are lots of reasons for that beyond uh, the scope of the talk today. Um, but we want to see these findings across labs. We want to see these with slightly different samples, slightly different methods. Then we really believe that there's something there. Um, this is particularly true, I want to say, about neuroscience findings, which are notorious for not always being replicated. Um, the last thing I want to note, um, and I've alluded to it, um, there are probably cultural influences on mindfulness, the way it manifests. There also are cultural influences that are going to dictate how people report on self-report instruments. And we need to be more mindful of that. So there's been some research with Ruth Bear's uh, five-facet mindfulness measure with uh, folks from the East that practice uh, Buddhist practices that we think are contemplative. And they don't score as high as American college students that have never practiced any sort of contemplative activity. Um, so clearly there's work to be done to make making these more culturally sensitive and responsive to populations that may use different language and may have been reared in a different cultural milieu where these things may actually mean different things. Okay, so I want to stop there. My buffet is over, it's empty. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Michelle for this practice that you guys have here. We're going to have time for questions, but do you want to use this? So what we're going to do is take about five minutes and
talk to the people at your table. So are there questions that you want to raise as a table? Are there interesting things that you saw or heard in this? Um, what's making you curious? So we'll take five minutes at the table, which you may not have chosen your table with that in mind, but that's part of the randomness of the assignment, right? Uh, makes a good psychological study. Um, and then in five minutes, we'll, um, I'll reconvene us and we can um, ask Dr. Schultz the questions that we have. Thanks. Test. So this one, is this one? I've turned it on. Part two, you can turn it on. It's really comprehensive. Really? Comprehensive. I just told you. Um, I'm struck by the monks and what do you say culturally? I, I would like to do some because uh, yeah, we're going to yeah. I just would. I, I, I Yeah. 
Okay, I think oh, now we're really on. That should have woken everyone, everyone up. So I'm going to warn people that this mic is really sensitive. So don't hold it too, too close to you. We're good. Okay. Um, all right. This one you don't want to get too close to. He's going to fix that. We'll see. Um, so what we'd like to do now is open the floor for questions. Um, from tables, from individuals, and we'll bring the mic around because that'll make it easier to hear. So if you have a question, raise your hand and Kathy or I will show up with the microphone and we'll try to keep track of it. Okay. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one was towards, I think, the slide before this one where it was the reflection of negative experiences. And one of the things that you said there in the end was facilitates meaning making. What does that mean? Yeah, so good question. Um, so by meaning making, the idea is that if you can take a certain distance from a negative experience while you're reflecting on it, you can think about questions that are related to why. So why did I do that? Um, what can I learn from that experience? Um, and the connection I want to make to mindfulness is a kind of distance I Heartedly about curiosity. So the language that Cross and I Duck will use is people almost um, reflect on the experience as if they're watching themselves in the experience, but they're not directly in the experience. Um, so it allows people in some ways to step back and to think about things from a different perspective than they may have had originally. And, and oftentimes that leads to some conclusion or some lesson that they may be able to take away from that experience. Where, where does a uh, common guy like myself, I'm a golf instructor, I'm also the golf coach here at the college, to learn this skill and then be able to share it, you yeah. know, with my players on my team? Yeah. Um, so golf would be a great application, and I'm sure people have done it. So there's a lot of stuff on the web these days. Um, a good place to start is to go to John Kabat-Zinn's website um, um, for the Center for Stress Reduction. There are a fair number of resources available. Full Catastrophe Living the Book is also available. It's not expensive. There are also lots of used copies. And Full Catastrophe Living is sort of the guide to the manual that teachers will use to teach MBSR, so it's not a bad place to start as a lay person learning what some of the, it has instruction on some of the exercises, so it'll teach you about the breathing exercises, it'll teach you the body scan. Um, there also are a lot of resources, again, on the web, so there are MP3 downloads that you can get that your players could use, that you could use to learn things. So all you have to do is search. I did some searching recently for this. I use them when I teach classes. So these are meditations online that will teach you breathing exercises, will teach you body scans. But if you're interested in the kind of mindfulness that I talked about directly, Full Catastrophe Living is a really good start um, as, a, as a book to look at. There also are on their website, there are other commercial products, including tapes and things you can play in your car and things like that if you have a commute. Yeah. I also want to say that lots of counseling centers, this is a, an area that's of great interest to uh, students. Uh, at Bryn Mawr, where I teach, uh, there's been an explosion of interest in mindfulness. Uh, the deans and the counseling, off, counseling center both offer services related to mindfulness. So there may be already people on campus here that know something about it and might even have an interest in working with someone that works with athletes, I don't know. Yeah. I don't control the mic, so I don't want to point. Oh, yeah. uh, I have three quick ones. First of all, <laughs> you said that the left brain dominant, yeah. you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Left is right in this case. That's right. Left, left is the good one. Is e it's easier to meditate if you're left brain dominant. 
Is that correct? So, so it's not quite that. Left brain dominant people generally tend to be happier and they're more even tempered. And it's clear from research that after people meditate for a while, at least in this study, their asymmetries t uh, uh, shift towards that left dominant direction. Well, isn't it true that it's the right brain hemisphere that provides all of us with more creativity, more love, more empathy, more compassion? And Jill Bolt, Bolt Taylor, when she was having her meltdown, her lack of brain activity, became more of a we person than an I. So, so this is a common question that I get asked and lots of people do because of this research. I'm sure Richie Davidson has heard a lot. And what I want to say is that the generalizations that we made in the past about the left brain, right brain distinctions are probably a little overdone. Um, and this is in a particular area of the brain where we're thinking about control over certain emotional systems, although it's a very large area of the brain. So one of the things I didn't say is that the EEG method that was used in those studies, we have much more fine-grained tools involving MRI studies um, and even functional MRI studies that allow us to get a, a more um, site-specific picture of what things are involved. Um, so neuroscientists, and I'm not a neuroscientist, I just play one sometimes, um, but neuroscientists really focus um, on much more narrow areas of the brain as opposed to this right-left hemisphere distinction. Um, now you're, you're suggesting an important question, what is it about the left side versus the right side? And from Richie Davidson's standpoint, it has to do something what he calls a kind of approach avoidance system, that folks that are left dominant he thinks have more of a, a brain activation system that engages them in approaching things as opposed to running in fear from things. That's his explanation for it. Uh, okay. Um, why do we become more empathetic and compassionate when we meditate, is there something that is going on with a part of the brain? Yeah. So it's a really important question. It's a complicated question. So I'm going to give you the, the easier answer, which is a narrow question. There's been some really interesting research on one particular brain area, which is called the insula. And the insula is important for um, lots of things, including awareness of our own sensory experiences, but it also seems to be important for experiencing pain and understanding the pain of others. So it's a kind of empathy that's important. Um, and there's been a fair amount of research looking at the insula and people who engage in meditation. Um, the question I find interesting that you're asking is, is there something about just narrowing your attention and focus that leads to greater empathy or compassion? And I don't think we know the answer to that. But there's a cheating answer here, which is that most mindfulness-based interventions also have a compassion component that I alluded to. So in the process of being less judgmental and more accepting of yourself, there's encouragement to focus that accepting and non-judgmental approach to others. So it's a pretty explicit part of most mindfulness-based interventions. Last one, yeah. and that is? Yeah. One question, because yeah. there are oh. lots of people waiting. Okay. I have eight questions for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting old, my memory doesn't work that way. Yeah. My, my, <laughs> one question, the, the mindfulness uh, seems to be fascinated with the ways of the Eastern uh, Buddhist monks and yeah. their method of meditation. Yeah. Now, in the West, yeah. we have come a long way from the time of Buddhism. Yeah. We've gone through Christianity, we've gone through the Renaissance, we've yeah. gone 2,000, maybe 3,000 years. Has anyone thought that what the Buddhists may be saying about meditation doesn't particularly, or it's very interesting, but isn't there other meditative methods that have been developed through the Western method, through the Western experience? So the that answer, might be more appropriate to us in the modern 21st century. Yeah. Good. So there, there are lots of, <laughs> of Western traditions that are important, contemplative traditions that are important. Um, and um, what I meant to do by the review was just to note how important Eastern traditions have been, and they continue to be probably unduly. Uh, influential, but there certainly are Western practices, there are Christian contemplative practices, centering prayer practices, a whole bunch of things that I think are relevant to this discussion. They haven't been as well studied. Uh, interesting question why they haven't. Um, but I also want to give some credit to John Kabat-Zinn that um, this eight-week 
manualized program that he came up with um, is a pretty good translation, Western translation, of fairly complicated ideas that have a very esoteric history in, in Buddhism. Um, it's a pretty extraordinary piece of work, I think, that he's done. Um, and it's so good that if you that if you ask Buddhist practitioners to read this, and we've done this, um, we've brought these ideas to Japan and asked people to read some of Kabat-Zinn's ideas, and they see this as the Buddhism that they're growing up learning in their temples. Um, but Westerners wouldn't know that. This sounds very Western and practical, the way that he's done it. So he purposely avoided the trappings of spirituality and religion. Again, his goal was to try and get accepted in medical settings where there's a lot of cynicism. So I think it's a really interesting work, and as a work of translation, it's quite an extraordinary translation. David, David Lieberman in his book, If God Were Your Therapist, highlights awareness as God's greatest gift to human beings. And, you know, my own interpretation of that is that when Moses asked God, who are you? God said, I am. I assume talking about awareness again, is what you're studying ultimately going to lead us to building that relationship with a living God? So there, there are folks that are interested in the spiritual dimensions um, and the connection to God. A lot of this research doesn't have a particular connection. Uh, and again, because there are connections to Eastern traditions in which there aren't kind of a monotheistic tradition, um, it's a kind of, you know, has a wide variety of um, connections, I think, to spirituality and religion. Um, so that's not an area that I do research on directly, uh, but there are definitely folks out there doing this kind of research that focus more on the spiritual connection and its um, connection to other ideas and uh, not just theistic ideas, but other religious ideas uh, that come from all sorts of traditions. It's just not an area that I happen to do research in. Hi. Um, I have a question, a practical question. Mm -hmm. Every time I've tried to do uh, breathing exercises, I tried to take a yoga class where we started mm -hmm. with that, and various other ones I've done, every time I try to do that, I hyperventilate. Mm -hmm. it, you know, and they always start with that. Mm -hmm. So I, I get blocked right at the beginning. Yeah. Is there some other way into this? So the first thing I want to emphasize, a great question, I thank you for asking it, um, is that the kind of breathing we're talking about in mindfulness-based practice is not a change in your breathing. It's your normal breathing. So sometimes it is hard for people when they pay attention to their breathing. Odd things happen, like hyperventilating and other things. Um, but the, the request is not to slow down your breathing or to make it more rhythmic. It's just to notice things. So um, I had a conversation recently with someone who's working with cancer patients, including folks that have lung disease, that had lung cancer. And breathing exercises are, are complicated for other reasons, and they're also scary. Um, but again, there's something nice about the breath, because you carry it with you. It's always there. It's rhythmic in a certain way. So one possibility of the kind of yoga breathing you've done, in which there's often an attempt to change the breathing pattern might be problematic as opposed to just paying attention. Um, there are a bunch of other exercises though, and I talk about the raisin one because it's so simple, um, but paying attention to your body, uh, you can start with your hand and your arm. Uh, those are all things, again, we carry our body parts with us so we can also do quite easily. So it may be that you have to go on to what's often more complicated. Uh, so they're done in this order for a reason. Breathing is really the beginning technique because it's often uh, one that people can begin to understand. Uh, I don't want to use the word master, but begin to get better at, and then moving on to other techniques. So a, a one hour body scan is a hard technique to do. Most people fall asleep when they do it the first time. Um, so there are other challenges that come up. Um, there, were, um, there was a recent study at Oxford University, uh, and it was supported by one from University of California, San Diego, uh, suggesting that uh, people who use uh, um, mindfulness te techniques um, often um, have a degree of forgetfulness and even uh, false memories. Yeah. Now, that doesn't sound too great to yeah. me. Yeah, that's not a good one. So, so the slide I was going to end on, I wasn't going to talk about that study, but I was going to talk about this other side. So we're in a period where mindfulness is hot. That's how I began the talk. Um, I think there's a lot of excitement about what the possibilities are with mindfulness. But I don't know of one thing that's all good. 
I guess is what I want to say, or one practice that's all good. So there are cautious um, uh, findings coming out. This is one example that there's a woman at Brown uh, that studies bad reactions that people have. And here I'm not talking about hyperventilating. I'm talking about um, mental health challenges that they have when they begin to practice mindfulness. So for people who are troubled and spend a lot of time not trying hard not to focus on their experience and not thinking about what's bothering them. Mindfulness can be quite intrusive and difficult, particularly at the beginning, because the, the instruction is to focus on your experience. So it can't be that this is universally all good for people. Um, so I think it is important to, to recognize that their findings, it's an area of research that I, say, that I would say is growing, um, and I'm pleased that you brought it up. I didn't want to end on a downer. So. Insofar as the uh, <clears throat> uh, cog cognitive augmentations you spoke of uh, that can be resulting from meditative practices, are you aware of or can you comment upon the various uh, oral, A-U-R-A-L, uh, induction techniques, uh, i.e. binaural beat or other things that alter with brainwave functions that help, uh, uh, let's say, exacerbate, if you will, uh, one's meditative practice? I, I know not enough to say thoughtful things about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I have been, I've done um, mindfulness for five years now, and um, I have finally got into the point where I do body scans, mm -hmm. but they're really, I seem to be struggling with them to the point where I s start, like, getting really nervous and sweating mm -hmm. and I don't know how I can like wean into it in a more natural way. Yeah. So um, one of the advantages of taking a class is that you have some structure and some guidance from the instructor and this would be an interesting part of a discussion in an MBSR class or any mindfulness-based class. And you're gonna have other people in the room. These are group classes that might have either similar experiences or other challenges. Um, and what an MBSR instructor would say is that it's important for you to pay attention to your experience. Uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with sweating, for example. What is the experience like for you as you're sweating? Um, what do you notice about your body? What thoughts begin to enter your, your, your mind? And can you begin to train yourself to bring your attention back to focusing on the body part that you were focusing on when you started attending to the sweat? So it would be the same instruction as for anything, just like with the raising, we're trying to bring our attention back as our mind gets focused on certain things. Um, and oftentimes it's the implications of things, right? So um, what's it like to sweat? What do you worry about, right? That would be the focus. What's your experience? Where do your thoughts go? Can you bring the attention back? That would be what an instructor would do. Um, the MBSR class builds up in a certain way, so it starts with simple observations like the observation on a raisin, uh, to breath, body scan is next, and the common problem I suggest in body scan is people fall asleep. It's a long exercise. Uh, people often find it relaxing, but not everyone does. And some people have particular areas of their body that they have um, worries about or sensitivities to or medical problems with. Um, so it's often a topic of conversation about what the experience is like when you're doing a body scan. My question had to do with uh, this process up here. Uh, can that be used uh, to treat PTSD? So there, there's a really interesting study that just came out that I looked at very quickly, so I can't really speak authoritatively about it. Um, but this is a really hot area. I hesitate to use this language here, but in some ways this is like the holy grail here of psychology. How can we pay attention to things and not have some of the adverse consequences that occur? So it's occurred to people, could this be helpful for people who have experienced trauma? Um, and with folks that have experienced trauma, there are a number of other concerns that have to do with safety and the potential for flashbacks. Um, so it's a, it's a much more complicated question. Uh, there was a study that was done with veterans that had PTSD that were returning from engagements. And I'm not remembering the findings, but uh, there was something like some of the parameters that they measured um, showed 
benefits when people were able to do the self-distancing procedure. In this study, they uh, instructed people on how to self-distance as opposed to self-immerse. And there were some clear benefits. What I, what I think, if I remember this correctly, is that the emotional benefits that have commonly been found outside of PTSD sufferers didn't replicate in that sample. But physiologically, they were able to talk about the event without experiencing some of the high degrees of reactivity that other people, I think that's what they found. But this is an area of very uh, current and active research, is what I would say. Yeah. Just one more question. I just wanted to share that um, for those who are interested in taking a class, both Jefferson and Penn are offering constantly, each season they offer classes, the eight week, if you Google pen and mindfulness or Jefferson and mindfulness, you'll find uh, that I, I, I know that Jefferson is about to start a cycle pretty soon. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning that. We're actually quite blessed, actually, to have two incredible places that are really leaders in offering these kinds of classes. So thank you for, for mentioning that. Really terrific people at both places. Right, and that's a perfect spot perhaps to end with places to go to um, experience this and find out more. Let's thank um, Professor Schultz for a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks.